How do we get to the point where we hate each other so much based on political affiliation? Without even inquiring about the specifics of our point of view. I mean, on many, many, many issues, the difference between Democrats and Republicans is trivial, almost non-existent. Indeed, the difference between Democrats and Republicans and me is, a, is the real difference. That's huge. Huge. Difference between them? Eh, not so different. They all look the same. Very similar from where I'm standing. They all want to control my life in one way or the other. They want to regulate me one way or the other. So what is the mixed economy? The mixed economy is where we've left certain aspects of human life. We've left it for individuals to make decisions for themselves. We've left certain parts of the world free. And we control others. And which ones do we control and which ones do we leave free? It depends. It depends if it's Democrats or Republicans. It depends on who gets the vote. We've given the government the ability to redistribute wealth, to choose winners or losers in business, to decide who to bail out and who not to bail out. And, and this is true of Democrats and Republicans. Democrats bail out some industries. Republicans bail out other industries, you know, uh, uh, Democrats bail out certain individuals. Republicans bail out other individuals. But the point is they're all bailing people out, regulating, controlling, redistributing. And what happens in a world where I know that those other guys can take my stuff and those other guys can tell me what I can and cannot do and those other guys can bail me out? No, you know, so, well, whether I get money or money taken from me, whether I get my life controlled or not, is to some extent at least dependent on which group I belong to. So groups immediately are elevated. It's not about me personally. It's whether I belong to a union or whether I'm in need or whether I'm a businessman, but then it depends if I'm a businessman doing business with China or a businessman doing business with Texas, or business and doing business with Mexico, what industry I'm in, am I in big tech, or am I in coal, or am I in oil or gas? All of these things, the particular group in which I belong, is going to determine how the government is going to treat me. And if I rally around with other people who are similar to mine, my group, then we can put pressure on the government to try to make us better and those other guys worse. And when a mixed economy slowly, slowly inches more and more and more towards is gang warfare. And the gang warfare is not manifest in the beginning in violence. It's manifested in what Ayn Rand called pull peddling. In trying to establish pull with the government. In trying to manipulate politicians in trying to manipulate those who have the power to redistribute and control. And for decades, for decades in this country, we've been slowly, slowly establishing little gangs, gangs that vote, gangs that lobby, gangs that do what they want in, the con in Washington, D.C., to try to shift the resources around so that they get more and other guys get less, benefit themselves at other people's expense. And it's not just business. It's nonprofits and it's the poor and it's unions and it's a whole variety of different entities, different groups lobbying and manipulating and distorting and trying to get a bigger, bigger piece. So we've got this going on. You know, Donald Trump, who is a genius when it comes to marketing, who is a genius is coming up, comes up with labels for things. I mean, he labeled it the swamp. And it is. It's a swamp. In a sense that it's ugly, it's dark, muddy, filthy. The animals, the people working to rearrange 
your freedoms are doing it submerged. They're unseen. I mean, you don't know what goes into any of these pieces of legislation. Hey, Congress doesn't know what goes into these legislation. You remember uh, uh, Pelosi's famous words, we'll find out what's in Obamacare after we pass it. But even then, it will take years because regulatory agencies write it, they change it, they talk to lobbyists, they, you know, rearrange it. So there really is a swamp. There's a speech in, uh, in um, Atlas Shrugged by Francisco D'Anconia. It talks about the aristocracy of Paul. Well, but this is, I mean, aristocracy is too nice of a word. These are swamp animals of Paul, right? They do it in hiding, behind closed doors. They never see the sunlight. They, what they actually... The result never sees the sunlight. All kind of groups, all kind of interests, interests, all kind of pressure groups, all kind of gangs, all kinds of swamp animals inhabit this swamp. And they determine how much taxes I pay, what I can deduct, what businesses I can open, how regulated the business will be, who I can employ, how much I pay them, what my health insurance is going to cost, am I going to have health insurance? All of these are things that are not dictated by the market. All of these things are determined by these creatures in Washington, D.C., pulling levers and pulling strings, and we vote for them. We vote for them over and over and over again, and the one... I'd say excuse. One reason for voting for Trump was he seemed like an outsider who would not tolerate this kind of behavior. And he talked about the swamp animals and clearing the swamp. Now, I never bought it because I believe Trump is an entrenched swamp animal. Uh, and, and it was just a matter of changing the animals in the swamp for his animals instead of the other side's animals. But I can understand why people bought into this because... This has been going on for decades, a century, really. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. We saw it under George W. Bush, and we saw it even worse under Obama. And Obamacare kind of caused this thing to bubble up onto the surface when Pelosi said, we'll only know what's in the bill after it. I mean, everybody paid attention. And it was a rallying call, and then the Tea Party suddenly was paying attention. And this other group was taking stuff away from me. This other group was taking my insurance away. They were taking my health care away. And suddenly, some of this, a tiny little bit of it, right, came up to the surface. We saw it with the bailout of the banks. Occupy Wall Street. I mean, again, the better motivation of Occupy Wall Street was, wait a minute, why are these creatures bailing out the banks? It, it, the, the banks, all the intellectuals, everybody in, uh, is telling me the banks did this. The banks caused this and were bailing them out. So in the late 2000s, early 20 teens, you had all this stuff, the extent of which our lives are being controlled by these pressure groups, just came to the surface in ways that maybe it was hidden before. And maybe the fact that the economy basically was stagnant, people felt like they were struggling. I think they felt like they were struggling more than, ever, more than they were. And then, on top of that, people were told that the world is a zero-sum game, that anything the billionaires make is at your expense, that the working class is no better today than it was 30 years ago. All lies, by the way, all lies, where they're told by, um, uh, by Pelosi, Biden, uh, Trump, uh, you know, any of these guys, or Piketty, or, or Krugman, or any of these. It's all a zero sum. They gain is your loss. You've been stagnating, they've been getting richer. Or, or take somebody who did get richer, like Elon Musk, who on some days I admire greatly. And yet he made his, 
next tranche of billions off of Tesla and off of solar energy, which both benefited massively from government subsidies. And he got rich. And the story is that the rest of us got poor. How? Because the government was divvying stuff up. How were they divvying it up, stuff up? By use of coercion and force. Remember, the mixed economy is about coercion and force, because how do we regulate? By force. How do we redistribute? By force. How do we decide who is OK and who is not? Force. Authority dictates from above. The ruling principle of a mixed economy is coercion. Coercion on some, not on all. It wouldn't be a mixed economy if it was on all. But who gets to be coerced and who gets not to be coerced? So force is the guiding principle of a mixed economy. Might makes right is all over the mixed economy. I mean, just replace might with a majority. Majority makes right. That's the evil of pure democracy. But it's not even the majority. It's not the majority that makes right. It's the powerful that makes right. It's the influential that makes right. It's the pull peddlers who make right. It's the people who pull the strings who make right. Not the conspiracy strings, which is the easy explanation for what's going on. Oh, they're just a, five guys in the back there pulling all the strings, and that explains them all. And they happen to be Jewish bankers, and that, oh, whoa, that's obvious then. No. It's all these groups fighting one another. And they make rights. No, but that can't be. Right isn't determined by pull peddlers, by the aristocracy of pull. Well, it turns out it is, again, for decades and decades and decades of the American history. Right, or what has actually been government policy, is determined by people using their influence to guide the power of government, which is might, when it's not used to defend rights. So the mighty make it right in government. And I would say that both the movement to the far left and the movement to the far right are responses to this. Well, wait a minute. We don't want the mighty to be deciding, the poor peddlers, the lobbyists, the influencers, the insiders, the creatures in the swamp. We don't want them to be deciding. We don't want them to be forcing us, coercing us, determining our life. We, we want to do it. And on the left, you get a big rise in what they call democratic socialism, this, this glorious idea that somehow we can get the poor peddlers out and majorities can rule, and we can just vote on everything, and it'll be a utopia like Denmark, even though Denmark's nothing like that. Right? But you get a rise in this idea that there's another way of doing it that gets rid of the swamp animals. In this sense, they agree with Trump completely. And the way to get rid of the swamp animals is to give more power to the people. It's to distribute things. It's to make everything more transparent and more open to the democratic process. Now, on the right, the regional backlash towards what's going on in Washington was the Tea Party, which said, oh, the solution to this is a return to founding principles. It's a return to the Constitution. It's a return to limited government. That didn't work out too well for them. First of all, they lost. They lost to Obama. And their representatives that they elected, the Tea Party senators and the Tea Party House members, didn't seem that different than the other creatures in Washington. And then a man came around and said, I can solve your problems. It's not through democratic socialism we solve these problems. It's not through more voting. 
It's by giving more power to a businessman. Who knows? Who knows implicitly what you need? And we'll get rid of all the pulp peddlers and all the, all the creatures in the swamp. And do the right thing for you, the exploited. A, a, a man who embraced the zero-sum world and told his followers, don't worry, the real evil is not among you, it's the swamp animals, it's the Chinese, it's the Mexicans, it's whatever. We've done this before. I've gone over this before. Of course, none of that actually happened. He didn't actually clear the swamp. But why didn't he clear the swamp? Well, we know. Because of the deep state. Because the Democrats wouldn't let him. Because the forces arrayed against him, the forces of evil, of darkness, were too great for him to overcome in four years. They went after him from day one, so he couldn't get it done. So it's us versus them. But now, it's not anymore just the million different groups fighting for pieces of the pie, for the redistribution, for anything they can get. No, now. Over the last eight years, I'd say, it's coalesced into basically two groups. There's the left and the right. Again, policy doesn't matter because there's not that big of a difference in policy. But it's us versus them. It's generally the groups who believe that we can attain a solution to this mixed economy by shifting it towards socialism. And a group that claims that we can solve the problems of this mixed economy by shifting it towards nationalism. But both blame the other side for where we are. Both want a clean slate. They want to wipe all the swamp animals out. They want to get rid of them. Both are frustrated. Both are being told. That no change is really possible. And both sides are demanding change. And they look and they see, well, how does Washington function? How does the mixed economy actually function? Well, it functions by might is right by force. It's just that the force is hidden. It's hidden behind government authority. It's hidden, it's hidden behind votes. It's hidden behind the guise of democracy. But it's force. And both sides are basically said, well, if it's force, if that's how things are done in this city, if that's how things are done in this world, then let's stop hiding. Let's put it out into the open. Let's just do it. And everybody, left and right, is saying, the talk show hosts, the intellectuals are saying, the only solution is revolution. Whether revolution of the left towards socialism or revolution of the right towards you know, whatever BS they claim they're advocating for. And you saw this. You saw this throughout the summer, the tension rise. You saw it leading up to the election, the demonization, a solidification of the idea they, whether it's left or right, they are the devil. They are evil. They are nasty. And if you add to that, an important addition, because the right doesn't have anymore a vision of what they want. They don't have a vision of how to solve these problems. The left does. It's an evil, wrong vision. But the right has none. It can't say, what's it going to say? We want capitalism? No, they don't want capitalism. 
They just had four years of Trump to prove they don't want capitalism. What do they want? They want the founding fathers? Do they want the Constitution? No. They've rejected the Constitution. Constitution is boring. It's too difficult. So they embraced a man, not a constitution. They embraced a man, not a set of ideas. They embraced Trump as the symbol of all that's potentially good. Why? Because he wants to drain the swamp. Why? Because he talks down to the people they view as evil. He talks down to the people who are violent, who used force. He fights against those that the right has labeled as evil and nasty and wrong and bad. And they embrace Trump. Not a cause, not an agenda, not an idea, but Trump. And everything is now manifest in Trump. So when the election happened and the Messiah lost, which he did, that was completely unacceptable to them. And it's one thing if it was unacceptable to them and that was it. But again, the intellectuals on the right, the talk show radio talk show hosts on the right, the television hosts on the right, and the president of the United States and the people surrounding him kept feeding them a fallacy, kept feeding them a lie, kept feeding them fake news. They kept feeding them, oh no, he didn't lose. It was stolen from him because he can't lose because he is a messiah. How can a messiah lose? But I don't blame, for the most part, I don't blame the people who rushed in to the Capitol. I don't blame the people who feel alienated, the people who feel lost, the people who feel betrayed, the people who feel like they have no say in this country, the people who feel like their lives are being crushed by swamp animals, by a bureaucracy, by a political system that doesn't care about them. I don't blame them. I blame the people who feed them who encourage them, who sustain them, who provide them with the intellectual ammunition, the fake news, the fake ideas, the fake perspectives. They're the ones to blame. Whether it's Hannity and Tucker Carlson and Mark Levin, Rush Limbaugh, who this year, who last year, you know, or two years ago, whenever it was, who said, you know, yes, we were faking it when we said that Deficits were bad. We, we know deficits are fine. <laughs> because it's our guy running the deficits. And it's fine. It's, if it's the other guy, then we lie. Putting to shame the idea that only the left does fake news. Rush Limbaugh does fake news, and he admits it. And from election day on, people are told the election was stolen from you. Force was used against you. The powers to be... The people around here, the people who hate you, the people who don't understand you, the people you don't like, they are running your life. They are manipulating you and they are stealing from you. And you better do something about it. And you know what? Given that the election is over and Trump lost, what are you going to do about it? Well, the only thing to do about it, the only way to fight it, particularly on that January 6th morning when Trump was standing in front of them and Congress was basically doing a procedural count to certify that Biden had been elected. It was meaningless, just a requirement in a process. But when you continue to say it's stolen and you better do something about it, what were they supposed to do? They saw in the summer, that violence was okay. They lived their entire life in a system that legitimizes violence. They've been inspired for months that it is time for a revolution. That there's no other way. That things are being stolen from them, taken away from them, by force, by coercion, by authorities. That the only way to stand up 
is to fight. The only way to stand up is to use force. Just like the left did. But we'll one-up them because we've got the President of the United States on our side. So we'll go to the heart of it. We'll go to the Capitol. We'll go right to the center of power. We'll do a real revolution. Now, you know, I don't know how many of them thought they were going to actually have an impact. I don't know how many of them thought they would engage in a revolution. I mean, how many of them thought, anyway, it was a pretty weak <laughs> revolution, pretty badly planned revolution. But that's basically, we're going to stop the democratic process from working, the voting from working, because that's all that's left to us. And force has been legitimized. Being legitimized. And don't start arguing with me about this case or that case of election fraud. Give me a break. I, I, we're not going to talk about it anymore. It's a myth. It's a way to manipulate people. It was that from day one. It's why no court took it seriously. Because there's nothing there. There's no there there. You can do wonders with videos. You can do wonders with arbitrary claims about voting machines. You can do wonders with arbitrary claims about anything. The arbitrary is amazing. I can claim anything I want and go prove I'm wrong. There's a gremlin right out of my desk here feeding me all this valuable information. The propaganda, the mythology. I blame all you people who are spreading this propaganda, who have not done the fact-checking, who have not gone and actually tested. Not, I'm not talking about going to other right-wing places that vindicate what you think already, but actually doing fact-checking. You're the ones to blame, and you're the ones to blame if you ex sped this. Now, again, the people really to blame are the intellectuals. The people really to blame are Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump knows he lost. And certainly Giuliani knows Trump lost. And certainly Mike Levin knows that Trump lost. And Rush Limbaugh knows that Trump's lost. But facts don't matter to them. They're out to get the other side. They're about power. And I hear it all the time on the chat. I, I, I saw it on YouTube constantly when I was arguing with people about Twitter. And they said, look... The left is winning. What are you going to do about it? And I said, uh, you know, I'm still going to advocate for rights protecting. And what do they call me? A wimp. Idealistic wimps continue to advocate for the Constitution for rights protecting. What we need now is to lie, cheat, steal, use muscle and force in order to get our way. Because that's what the left has done to us for decades. So we need to do the same to them now this is what people are saying. So why would I believe a word they say about a stolen election if that's the case? If they've given up on reason, if they've given up on argument, if they've given up on, on convincing people, on arguing, on debating, because they think that's a wimpy strategy, if they've given up on individual rights, if they've given up on the Constitution, why should anybody believe anything they say? Just like I don't believe the left. Just like the left is full of it when it comes to, I mean, I'm talking about the far left, it's full of fake news. Lies about the economy, lies about the world in order to get their way. The right is now adopting exactly the same methodology. They don't care about the truth. The people I argue with don't. I see it all the time, and they'll admit it if they're honest. They don't care about the truth. What do they care about? Beating the left. And they'll tell you. All they care about is beating the left. And the fact is, what does the left care about? Beating the right. And this all is an outcome, a consequence. A political consequence. The other philosophical consequence. It's all a political consequence of the ultimate political cause, which is the mixed economy, which is allowing the use of force against some members of society who don't Deserve it. That is the use of the initiation of force. It's a consequence of redistributing wealth. It's a consequence of regulation. It's a consequence of bailouts. Ayn Rand always said this would devolve into 
group warfare. And all of it now is culminated in this group warfare. We got two groups, big groups. The radical, or, you know, the far left and the far right who are view the other as evil, the enemy, the epitome of the devil. To a large extent, they're both right, because they both are that. And are willing to do anything to destroy the other. And the difference, and what I think made Capitol Hill worse than the summer, is that the group on the right is being encouraged by the President of the United States of America. Yes, the group on the left is being encouraged by many politicians and was being encouraged by many intellectuals. But the politicians in power did not encourage it. Now, Biden is very weak on this, but he's not an encourager of it. Kamala Harris is borderline an encourager of it. But Trump is a cheerleader, is an inciter, is a rallier. And that's what makes it worse. It's reached the highest level of government. And it's reached almost every intellectual. You look and, and you look at, at talk radio and you look at, you look at Fox and, and it's just horrifying, horrifying. And if you look at the flip side, if you look at CNN, it's just, CNN is just horrible. The bias, the BS, the nonsense, their willingness to defend the most outrageous things done in the name of the left or done in the name of social justice. It's outrageous on both sides. And it has to lead to violence. There's no other place it can lead to. The only thing holding back the violence right now, and who knows what will happen next week, the only thing holding back the violence is the cowardice of the participants. You know, with, with the National Guard out, with armed law enforcement. I mean, this is the thing about the riots in the, in the summer. If law enforcement had stood up, had used their guns, had actually fought back, enforced law and order, if some of those Capitol Police had pulled out their guns, not inside, to defend the Senate chamber or whatever, but outside, before there were, these people ever got in. They shot in the air and then pointed. And the rioters had been convinced that they would pull. None of this would happen. And the same with BLM riots. The same with the left. It is the failure, the failure of law enforcement, which has made it even more convincing now that force can work. But I think when the police are out in force, when the National Guard is out, people are they're too cowardly to actually go out and fight. And if, you know, some people have compared numbers. They said, you know, BLM in the summer killed a lot more people than the Capitol. That's true. But if you add up all kind of far right violence and far left violence, it's not as, not as clear cut. If you look at people like the guy who shot up the Pittsburgh synagogue, or you look at people, the guy who shot up the Walmart in El Paso, motivated by a far right, clearly a far right agenda. It's not clear who's more violent and who's killed more people and so on, but that's not the point. The point is that both sides now have decided to make the violence explicit out in the streets, without hiding, without playing games, And they feel that that is the only solution. The only way out of this. And by the way, one of the things, one of the essays, one of the intellectuals that are most responsible for this attitude, for this mentality on the right, is an essay written in, in 2016 that I did a whole show on. I did a whole show on this in 2016. You can find it on YouTube. And that is the Flight 93 essay. And the Flight 93 essay by uh, Anton, I forget his first name, something Anton, who is now, um, he, he published it anonymously because he was afraid of the consequence. But now he's a senior guy at the Claremont Institute, at the Claremont Review of Books. 
Anyway, Anton wrote this essay, and basically what he said was, the United States is finished. Michael Anton, Michael Anton. The United States is finished probably no matter who gets elected, he said in 2016. But there's absolutely no question that if Hillary Clinton gets elected, this country is toast. We're all dead. We're all finished. I mean, exactly the same rhetoric you're hearing now about what will happen when Biden gets elected. And, you know, Biden didn't get elected, did get elected, so you're going to see that the United States will not end. But that's the rhetoric. Now, he said in the essay, it's probably true that the United States is finished even if Donald Trump gets elected. But, he said, Donald Trump gives us a chance of winning. Gives us a chance of stopping these hordes of evil leftists from taking over government. And therefore, you have to vote for Donald Trump. It's like, why is it called Flight 93? Why did he call the essay Flight 93? Flight 93 was the flight on September 11th where the passenger said, we're going to die if this pilot pilots the plane. We know we're going to crash into the Pentagon or whatever, into the White House. We're probably going to die as well if we rush the cockpit. But at least rushing the cockpit gives us a chance. In other words, it's desperate. It's life or death. It's the end of civilization. And Trump is the only person who can save us. Let's roll was the calling call of Flight 93. And let's roll is the calling call in a sense of the attack on the Capitol. But of course, it's a travesty to use those two in comparison. Let's roll in Flight 93 was an act of incredible bravery, of heroism, of a commitment to freedom and to, to the lives of the people on the ground and to, and to America and what America represents. The attack on the Capitol was a negation of all of that. And indeed, the essay, Flight 93, is a negation of what America means. So what's the solution? Well, the solution, the ultimate solution, is a rejection of everything both the left and the right stand for. Primarily a rejection of mysticism, rejection of superstition, a rejection of conspiracy theories, a rejection of emotionalism, a rejection of everything but reason. It's a return and an embrace of reason. <clears throat> That's the solution. Reason rejects force. Reason is the anti-force. Reason is the idea that arguments get resolved by facts, evidence, argument, disputation not by raising a fist. So it's a matter of rejecting all of the emotionalism that both the left and the right embody. And, but, but rejecting it with an alternative. The alternative being reason. Place reason in a place. I shouldn't try to quote Thomas Jefferson because I'll butcher it. But remember what it says in the Jefferson Memorial about reason. And then in political, politically, it's about the rejection of collectivism. A rejection of all forms of collectivism, left and right. A rejection of the group as the unit. And an embrace of individualism. And what that means politically is a negation of the mixed economy. What we need is to limit government, to restrain its power, to do away with its ability to coerce and to force and to redistribute and to regulate and to control. As long as government determines who gets what, pressure, force, violence, coercion are the end result. There's just no way around it. We need to embrace capitalism. We need to embrace the separation of state from economic state from our lives other than protecting us. All right. 
So capitalism is the solution. Reason is the solution. Individualism is the solution. And a pox on both their houses on the right and on the left. Because they are the collectivists, the emotionalists, the mystics, and the statists. Everything that we should be against. Everything that every American, real American, should be against. We don't need to decentralize. We don't need to secede because the people decentralizing and seceding are just as bad as the people who run things today. Small is not beautiful. It's ideas. It's what you think. It's your governing principles. It's not how big the group is that you're going to oppress. There's no more freedom at the state level than there is at the federal level. There's no more freedom at the county level than there is at the state level than there is at the federal level. And there is no more freedom at the little town level than there is at the county, state, and federal level. As long as the ideas are ideas of control, the ideas are ideas of oppression, the ideas the ideas of coercion, it doesn't matter how big the group is how big the political unit is, what matters is what they do. All right. Uh. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder. Please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now. Uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.